Welcome to the New Haven Free Public Library. Um, this is the Book Sandwiched In program. My name is Isaac Shubb, and I'm here uh, with Rory Martirana and our guest, Melanie Chardoff. Um, Melanie was born actually in New Haven, Connecticut, and uh, she attended high school in West Haven. She got her BA from Adelphi University in New York. Uh, she trained with legendary acting teacher Stella Adler and went on to, went on to perform on Broadway, off Broadway, off off Broadway, improv and comedy clubs, and everywhere an actor can pay her dues. From 1980 to 1982, she appeared on the late night live comedy show Fridays on ABC, where she joined the main cast along with Larry David and others. Fridays featured guest stars ranging from George Carlin to Susan Sarandon to Andy Kaufman. In 1989, she auditioned for and was cast as Dee Dee Pickles on the much-loved Nickelodeon show Rugrats. And of course, over the course of her career, she has done many, many, many other shows. Um, she's wow. also an inventor, um, but she is here today because she's published a book. It's out this year called Odd Woman Out, Exposures and Essays and Stories, which I have behind me. This is the book here. We're very pleased to have it in our collection. Um, and uh, I think it's fabulous. And as a, uh, a New Haven native, um, come back to us. Uh, Melanie was kind enough to actually come to the library um, to uh, take a tour, even though she lives on the West Coast. Um, and so I just wanna say, you know, welcome Melanie Chardoff. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you both. So you, um, you grew up here in New Haven and I guess we just want to start out by kind of covering that because you spent a, a good, you spent your childhood here, here and in West Haven, um, but you had a very tumultuous family life, which you talk about a lot in the book. Um, but at a relatively young age, you got involved in theater. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I know it's like a, you know, a huge question, but. <laughs> well, um, fortunately, there were a lot of people who were very obsessed with theater when I was young. Um, and we did a lot of plays at West Haven High School. And I would uh, audition at Oakdale, which was a music tent. I'm not sure they have that anymore, but, um, and I would go to the Schubert Theater in New Haven and I would go to the Long Wharf Theater, which is where I really got swept into the theater by an actor walking through the audience, speaking a, a monologue from the, from the play Volpone. And at one point he put his hand on my head and spoke part of this monologue to me about the deception that they were pulling on this older man who was pretending to be passing to see who's really a loyal person or who just wanted to grab money from his estate. And the moment he touched me, I felt I was in the play with him and I was so intrigued by being in the light and, and bringing this story to other people. I preferred that story on the stage to my own home life. I found that imaginary stories were, were more, more appealing for me and they were a great escape. So of course in high school, I auditioned for lots of plays and we had a very productive dramatic department at West Haven High School. Um, and I started my career there. And then I would uh, audition at Yale University and got cast in a musical called Three Penny Opera, which is formative to me. And then that show was repeated at the New London Opera Company, which was at the O'Neill Foundation in New London. And I was on my way. I was working with professional actors and I, I knew I wanted to major in that in college. And, um, and because of the Adelphi University's proximity to the train to New York City, I was able to audition for summer stock and be on soap operas. So I really started my acting career in college, fortunately, which gave me a little leg up uh, when I actually began to try to make a living at it, which was a whole other kettle of fish, as you can well imagine. If you're just joining us again, um, my name is Isaac, uh, coming to you from the New Haven Free Public Library. This is uh, the Book Sandwiched In program. I'm here with our guest, Melanie Chardoff, um, and my colleague, uh, reference librarian, Rory Martirana. And uh, Melanie, um, I just want to show a, uh, a quick um, video that I think gives us a little bit of a tour um, through, you know, your performance career. Do you want to kind of set us up a little bit for that? Well, I think someone made this for me when I was doing a Zoom in Los Angeles, actually, and uh, they just took photos from my career and set them to a song from the musical version of my book, Odd Woman Out, which I was commissioned to do for the Joshua Tree Comedy Festival. So the background score of this short video 
um, is a, a song called I'm Getting Famous, which was some of what the early part of the book is about, the phenomenon and the, and the trauma and suddenly being um, recognized by everybody, even the custodian at the restroom. I mean, it, it's really a startling change to happen to a person. Well, I'm going to share my screen and I think um, you should be able to play that for us. And then we can talk a little bit more. Uh, let's see. I am getting such attention. Everybody gives a mention. Get a mansion. Get a pension. I'm getting famous. They follow me. They swallow me. Fight for a piece of me. But my act is all they see. I'm getting famous. All this crap with people clapping. Even scared of all that's happening. Blame the fame for scaring life away. Well, your book, you talk a lot about uh, the process of getting famous, um, but you maybe you could start us off. Um, I think you were going to read us a little passage from um, uh, one of my favorite um, moments of your book, which is your, your start on Broadway um, and what happens to that show. Oh, I actually don't have a piece prepared from that, but I'll tell you about the show in short. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called The Galactica and it had a great pedigree. Peter Hall, soon to become Sir Peter Hall, was our director. Galt McDermott, who had written the music for Hair, was our composer. Raul Julia was our leading man. And I had my first onstage Broadway love scene with Raul, which was, I still haven't gotten over it. And um, I, um, I was, thrilled because it was the biggest salary I had gotten it as an actor. It was a Broadway credit. I was 22 years old. Things were just beginning. Most of the people in the show were first timers. And it was a brilliant science fiction rock opera where uh, trampolines were set in the stage disguised as craters. And they had this lava woodwork around them. And we had to leap weightlessly from one trampoline to the other simulating weightlessness in outer space. Anyway, as you can well imagine, a lot of accidents and sprained ankles and tragedies began to happen to the cast because of all the special effects uh, that we were involved with. Uh, much like Spider-Man about 10 years ago, um, the technology was a bit dehumanizing to the actors. Our bodies and our safety were not the first consideration. In any case, I want the people in the audience to take the book out of the library and read the story. It's called 
Road to the Stars. The name of the show is Via Galactica, and it's a, an infamous tragedy failure on Broadway. Um, it was the first million and a quarter uh, priced show that really busted. I think it ran three or four nights and we were sold out mostly because most of the theater community community was curious to see this debacle and our effects and the music were fantastic you just couldn't understand the show and in the actors and our talent were dwarfed by all the machinery so well I just want to say yeah that I um I, I highly recommend it to readers because um uh, Melanie you know is a serious actor who does uh, a great job of being um you know commenting um with great awareness about this process of being involved with all these people who are taking themselves very seriously um, and starting out at the beginning and at, you know the cast is kind of coming together and as you say you know before too long people are spraining ankles and getting a little disgruntled and you know the director is still going on and kind of making these grandiloquent speeches about you know how you know we're changing theater changing this whole structure of theater and and in a way, you know, it's like there are two sides to this because it was a very, very ambitious project and it was very new and exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It did lead to wonderful stagecraft and phenomena like the chandelier in uh, Phantom and incredible technology that has advanced the art of theater. Um, as long as it's coherent and the uh, talent and the tenderness and the heart that originated the idea for whatever play or work of art is, it is, it, it's not obscured. You know, I'm all for special effects if they enhance uh, the artistry and the craft of the actors. See, I'm someone who believes in the empty space, which was Peter Brook's wonderful book. I'm sure you have it in the library about all actors and performers really need is an empty space with some light to create great art, eloquent art. I'm sure over this last year, you've seen a number of Zooms where you found yourself moved and touched with just a face on the screen. So um, I'm all about craft and I'm all about our actor's craft and our musical craft not being obscured mm -hmm. by the artistry of the technical people. God knows technological people can create amazing phenomena now, very human seeming. Um, in the last few years, CGI has advanced to the point where little figures can make you cry and little figures can make you laugh and they're just creations in virtual space. Um, and that's one of the gifts of the voiceover actor bringing its heart, his heart, her heart to the technology to animate it, to give it life. Well, you did bring, um, oh, I'm sorry, Rory. Did you want uh, So I had a, a question for you in the book. You talk about catching the acting bug early and your father um, wanted you to continue working, but your mother was a bit more supportive for you. I was just wondering what advice you might give to young people whose both of their parents don't support their creative ventures at all. Well, generally our parents don't support us because they feel protective. Yep. Uh, they want our um, kids to be autonomous and make a living. And I think a young person has to prove themselves to their family as well as to the community at large. And today you have so much more access to visibility by making your own YouTube or your own TikTok. Um, and in this way, getting a well-directed, well-conceived, well-lit, audible um, version of yourself in which you are feeling your heart in the midst of all this, directing it, writing it, starring in it, so that your folks can see and get some reassurance that you're not just blowing your horn uh, needlessly, that you have something to convey that people will pay money for. So I think YouTubes are giving kids the opportunity uh, to really broadcast their skill. And of course, getting it seen is another part of your artistry. You have to really be a good public relations person without turning people off. And there's a really fine line there that young people have to follow. But there's some amazing creativity coming out of small towns, villages all across this country and others. Uh, expressing itself now through the medium. And um, we didn't have that. We used to have to get a barn and put on a play when we were kids, but now there's a, a forum and it's a very competitive forum, but maybe you can pull through it. So that's the advice I'd get. Get someone to film you on their phone or your phone, edit it, make it tight, make sure it's competitive and make sure there's some heart in it. 
Well, um, it did seem to me that, you know, despite coming from New Haven, which is not the smallest town, you know, in the world, um, it is still a, a smaller town. And, and I'm, you, I'm, I would think you, you probably might have seen it that way at the time. Um, and you write, you write in your book, I wanted a life in the theater where, where my uh, enormous feelings would be welcome as they were not welcome at home. Um, so in response to your desire to work as an actress, um, your dad said to you, who the hell do you think you are? Shirley Temple? <laughs> and meanwhile, <laughs> you're getting hired to dance by Phil Spector, I think. Um, right. So you really had a lot of, yeah, positive affirmation. Um, I was just over at a bar mitzvah. Um, myself and another uh, very wholesome girl were doing all the moves that we saw in Hullabaloo and Clay Cole in the 60s and 70s. And um, we danced alike. We would mirror one another. And uh, we got seen and recommended. And so soon we were dancing with uh, the Ronettes and the Crystals before your time, but they were terrific black girls groups. And Phil Spector was such a wily showman that he wanted to help those uh, black girl groups cross over for a white marketplace. So he hired us wholesome uh, dancers and to back those girls up. Uh, to make it a whole mise en scene of black and white together, which I loved. I mean, I, I learned all my best moves from African-American kids on bandstand. And I was on Connecticut bandstand. I don't think you have it anymore, but we had a very interesting replica of uh, American bandstand on WNHC in New Haven. And I, I was on that a couple of times doing the twist, you know, doing the... <laughs> The Watusi, I don't think the Watusi is done anymore because it would be seen as cultural appropriation. But back mm -hmm. then, um, we white girls wanted to do the black boy dances. And that's where I really learned to shake a leg, as they say, in New Haven on WNHC's American Bandstand, yeah, Connecticut Bandstand. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about, you know, some of your early work. Um, I mean, a lot of your formative work was in comedy, stand-up comedy, improvisational comedy, um, and um, what you know what that was like as a woman in a very male-dominated space, um, especially at the time. Um, you said you know it took a while for men to stop being squeamish and to truly laugh at gifted female comics. I think they felt very threatened by women like Elaine Boozler, who's still a pal of mine today. I don't get to see her often, but. Uh, she delivered like a guy. I mean, she was a great joke writer. And um, Phyllis Stiller sort of defeminized herself to get laughs. Uh, Carol Burnett as well. She didn't care how she looked. Um, and for me, it was a little difficult because I was pretty. And I would wear gowns and really emphasize my femininity to, to deliver comedy. And most of what I did was I would do characters, very broad characters. I would create scenarios and premises, and I would do these very broad characters and satirize um, men and women. And um, I, I was unusual because I was being feminine and satirizing glamour. I think there were a few photos that went by in that film strip where I'm in a gown and kind of acting kind of making fun of glamour. But at a certain point I had to embrace glamour, which is a character all women do. You know, glamour is when you hold your stomach in and you put on a lot of mascara and you shove up your cleavage. And, um, you know, I learned to do that without satirizing myself. And I found that it worked for me. But comedy, um, it happened to be a gift I had. It was a gift of survival. So I wouldn't get it beat up in, in school or my father and I wouldn't get into arguments. So I, I would deflect with comedy. So that was a survival skill, but I also am a good dramatic actor, so I just don't get to do it as often. You had mentioned opening up for major comedians like uh, Andy Kaufman and, and Robin um, Williams. Um, and you mentioned like that's basically a death sentence for, for comics. How, how intimidating was that, especially when men already had a hard time taking women comics seriously? Well, this was in... Um, New York, Andy Kaufman began doing his Mighty Mouse routine. And we were all just stunned by it because he had the audacity to just stand on stage, nodding to the music until his part would come up and you found yourself just waiting for it rather than you know rapid fire delivery. He was just kind of creating these scenarios where we would just watch him standing there 
nervous and excited and, and performing. And so going on after him, people were still talking about him. If I had to go on after him, it was difficult. That was in New York at the Improv. And then in Los Angeles at the Improv, I often went on after Robin Williams and his sets would extend from 20 to 40 to 50 minutes. And when I came on after him, the, the stage would be soaked with his perspiration and spilled water glasses, uh, you know, and people would still be laughing. And I would think, are they laughing at me or is this is his leftover laughter? Uh, but in any, in any case, it was hard to hit as hard as Robin. He was manic, he was brilliant, a genius, and he was improvising all the time. So yeah, those were death spots. But fortunately, I did get my moments in the sun enough to get auditioned for other shows. And that was, uh, I was lucky to be, to be on amongst amazingly talented people. Well, I'm, I'm interested, I've been interested in kind of tracing as your book does your, not just your career, you know, your career development on the one hand, but also your relationship and, and spiritual development. Um, and you talk about um, trying to commune with God or a higher power. Um, and you said you, you didn't get an answer immediately, but then I felt something shift inside me that maybe was always there, or maybe I made it up, a fallback, a certainty, a trust crept in out of nowhere, like I'd never felt with my anxious parents, something on my side. As an actor, I already knew how powerful belief could be, that it could change you from the inside out. I was determined to believe in that belief. And I just am reading that because um, I felt that you did a lot of things really well in the book. And, and one of them is to convey um, some of the strengths of an actor and some of the special properties I think that an actor has. And, and that kind of the, the, um, the strength of belief is, is one of them. Yeah, I was brought up in an atheistic family. Uh, my parents didn't uh, proselytize atheism, uh, but I certainly heard arguments at our home on the weekends when my father's poker buddies would come over and they would rail about the existence of God. And one man would say, of course there's God, it's, it's all around you. And my father would say, where, where? And so these were fascinating conversations to me. And my parents said, you can believe whatever the hell you want to. So I basically, I was always looking for something to believe in. And I found that believing in a story on the stage with other actors committed to that story for a month was my temple. I found that if we could all believe exactly the same way with no divisiveness in this fictitious story, it got me high. But then the show would end and I would be without a story and not really having my own story. I would be seeking, seeking again, another role to embody, to immerse myself in. But I did wanna read a story, Isaac, about when I had access because of my sudden fame to um, some big name guru at the time. Um, and, and I um, was suddenly going from small audience of theater crowds, like a hundred to a thousand people on Broadway. And suddenly I had an audience of millions and um, you know, you're doing the work of, of the, the craft of acting and performing. And at the same time, the world around you is changing in their attitude towards you. You're getting so much more incoming attention than you've ever had before and not from people you've ever faced, just people who are seeing the facsimile of your face through this electrical, electrical screen. Anyway, the pressures were very great. Also, I had come to Los Angeles and was suddenly moving here. And I didn't have that many close friends here. I had performing friends. I had people that I'd done plays with, but I didn't have my buddies, my intimate buddies yet. And uh, so I was cast on this late night comedy show called Fridays. And uh, Michael Richards and Larry David and other big energetic talents and writers were on the show as well. And it was very hard for us women to get heard or get any of our material on. We only had one female writer and she was like one of the guys. So she didn't really write to our talents. And I started to lose it. And I knew I couldn't have a, a nervous breakdown while I was shooting the show. We worked six days a week. There'd be no time to have a breakdown and recover. Um, so I would be bellowing in the restroom. I'd go in the ladies room and just cry in the stall. I mean, it was like crazy time. If my madness were made public, people might assume it was caused by the onset of celebrity over a matter of months. I was often panicky, feeling isolated amidst hordes of fans. This tidal wave of attention, of impersonal adulation, of salacious fan mail from prison and inmates was quite alienating. And my friends and my family's reaction to my fame were even weirder. 
My own mother glazed over and giggled in my presence about nothing. My old friends wore me like a merit badge on the one hand and prickled with envy on the other. There's nothing like a loved one's success to make one's own life feel like crap. My sudden notoriety seemed to be provoking breakdowns in others that I desperately needed to stay stable. But all of this was exacerbated by the sexy, witty writer who'd first followed me home from our pilot pickup celebration. And as our show ratings rose and he slipped over that fine line from comic genius to coke-addled maniac, I tried to anchor myself as his savior. He'd collapse and he'd recover from his highs in my arms, which I mistook for adoration. Well, the sex felt so good, but the hangover in my heart was hurting so bad. And once he was made head writer of the show, we could not escape one another, working crazy close too many hours a day and days a week. He would watch me on the overhead monitors all day, rehearsing scenes that he had written. And I would get his picky own notes on how better to deliver his words in his sketches. And he rewrote mine. Resentment and attachment throbbed in tandem in our bodies. The only way to escape one another was to have sex with each other every single day night. We spent that whole season murmuring yes, yes in the dark and muttering no, no in the light. My hunger to attach to something solid got me more and more mired in this horny human sinkhole. I learned too late that his ex-girlfriend had a nervous breakdown and attempted suicide when she heard that he and I were an item. Oh, this guy was a card-carrying crazy maker. So I uh, had a hiatus from the show, and I always went to my sanctuary in New York, my, my acting class there. And one night I was doing a scene from a Neil Simon play, and I started blubbering, which was like a dead giveaway that there was something very wrong. And so this kind of hippie actor named Laurel kind of took me aside, and she said, are you okay? And I said, no, I'm having nervous breakdown. And she listened to me talk about the element of fame and having a very public bad relationship and she said well you're not having a nervous breakdown you're having like a spiritual crisis and she told me she would get me a private audience with her guru the great name guru Muktananda and fortunately for me um, I had a friend I was staying with in New York Betty Buckley actually and she lived at 86 in Riverside um, back in the day and the bus to go to his ashram was leaving right from her corner and I thought well this is kismet it's meant to be it's a spiritual epiphany and so I boarded that bus and went up to the Catskills to what used to be a big resort nightclub, a Jewish kind of Catskills, the Borschfeld. This was now converted to an ashram and where there were once pictures of Shecky Green and Mort Saul around the pool, there were pictures of the greater gurus of the time. So um, I knew I was in another world and Laurel arranged, arranged an audience for me, mostly because I was a a television actor, and that made me very suspicious of this guru. Um, and I was fearing what I would be asked in return for my free audience. <clears throat> so Laurel, dressed in shimmery yoga attire, ushered, ushered me through a gold door off the ashram lobby called the Media Room. And there sat about 30 people, among them a well-known TV news anchor and crew, and the singer John Denver. So much for escaping the media and into an alternate universe. My cynicism tidal waved in. I might need to escape from this escape, I feared. We sat down on the plush rug and Muktananda seated on a satin tuffet with a gorgeous sari clad Indian woman translating to his right was blessing an older man who bowed and slid blissfully backward into the circle of observers, his face covered in tears of gratitude. And then Laurel shoved my gift basket forward and I crawled alongside it to face the guru, the guru and his beautiful translator. I felt like an imposter. Why have you come? The translator asked in a deep and sensuous voice. Baba fanned himself with a peacock wand. Please tell him that my mind is broken. I am very unhappy. The lovely woman translated to Baba and he babbled back to her in Indian. Baba says, you must stay here and meditate with us at the ashram for one year, she said. Um, tell him thanks, but I have to be back at work in July. I was so hoping that the speed read version of enlightenment would be instill, instilled by July 8th. I'd pay extra, I offered. There was a quick back and forth between the translator and Baba, and she said, 
Baba says, your peace lives here. But I'm on contract, you see, and there wouldn't be any peace for anybody or me if I broke it, I stammered. Were they gonna take me captive? My agents would be furious. The work of ending your suffering must be here with Baba, she said. But see, if I left the show, many others would suffer far worse, my agents, my crew. Hey, maybe Baba can come out to the studio and heal all of us. My smart ass persona needed to save face in front of the press. Baba seemed to be contemplating this. Grandly, he gestured to Laurel behind me. Can you give her a job on your show? The interpreter asked on his behalf. Oh, well, I said, I'm really in a position to hire Laurel, you see. Um, there are other people that do that. And you see, she'd have to come back to Los Angeles and put on some weight and some normal clothes. And suddenly he smote me on the head with a peacock wand and the group all gasped. I froze, but I had the presence of mind to open to the possibility of his externally applied enlightenment, his awakening of my Kundalini energy, his opening of my third eye, his goldening of my aura. I drank in the incense, I breathed it deep. Oh, I wanted it so bad. I was starving for a mind change to perceive things and myself differently, to dissolve my ego. Please, please, pretty, please. The whole room held its collective breath. Those few seconds passed like years. I surveyed my body and my brain for transformation. Was I blessed by an instant fix? Moved to change my life, my outlook, give up acting, comedy, clothes, meat, men, and money? I felt nothing. Just like that dancer girl in the musical chorus line on Broadway. So I bowed. I combination crawled, scampered backward. Others scanned my face for transcendence finding it inscrutable. Then somebody else's pricey fruit basket from the gift shop was shoved forward and Baba's playful gaze was onto the next and I was set free. As I rushed down from retrieving my things, new devotees poured off the bus and I got back on it alone for the trip back to New York City. Although relieved to be leaving, I felt heaviness rekindling in my belly. I was sad that I was so resistant to the gifts of the mountains, Baba and Laurel, that my misery was guru proof. I would have to find another way to heal my mind. So there's a cautionary tale called My Obscured Third Eye, which is midway through the book. I think Rory wanted to ask a question, but Rory, you're um, I'm always muted when I don't think I'm muted. Um, so there's a lot of this in the book, the themes of sort of trying to find yourself and also um, your different romantic endeavors and trying to find the perfect person for you. Um, and you're very upfront with a lot of the romantic mistakes that, that you've made in the past. Um, knowing what you know now, if you could go back in time, would you have done anything differently? Or do you think that would have ended with you not meeting Stan? Um, God, I think we all debate that if I knew what I knew now back then. Stan and I have both discussed because we both had a lot of challenges growing up. Um, a lot of anxiety that kept us from seeing clearly, um, that we would not have been ready for each other. There were certain learning curves that he and I both needed to survive before we would be ready for a monogamous, committed, all enveloping opening of the heart. Um, I think he and I are much more interesting people, both very odd people, by the way. Uh, we became even in our merging. Um, I think we learned a lot from all those traumas and recoveries. Um, it put a lot more uh, interest into us. You know, my mind in all honesty slides off of people who've never had a trauma. People who are more corporate cookie cutter kinds of people, I, more beautiful people. I find my face just kind of slides off them. It doesn't get me traction. The people that interest me are the complicated and the complex people. That's just me, others may feel differently. Um, and generally we were shaped by confusion and having to make solid choices in, in, in a, during a breakdown period where when you're in a breakdown, sometimes the, the few choices and the shining choices become really clear. 
and uh, you know there's no other way to go. One of the things that I dealt with a lot was, you know, I really hit the top. I was kind of the girl du jour in my late 20s for a short time. And when you hit the top, maybe not for everybody who's really well brought up and solid, when you hit the top, you find another bottom has just begun. And, um, you know, I don't know them personally, but I think that's maybe what George Harrison went through when he was a Beatle, that he found getting that famous, which is something young people sought and then suddenly were immersed in, can be very um, disturbing to the mind. It's not a natural phenomenon. And, uh, you know, when there was just theater, Greek live theater and through the ages, just a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a number of people, a couple hundred or thousand people. You could feel an intimacy, you had control over it. But when you're on a television screen and millions of people have access to you, uh, it's a very different phenomenon. And a lot of people want that kind of fame. A lot of influencers you know, want that kind of fame to be recognizable and visible everywhere they go. There's some downsides to it. And um, you have to have a very strong support system and a real strong sense of yourself to surf through that. That was my experience. Other people mm -hmm. may flow through it quite easily, hang on to themselves through it. I didn't. Yeah, you give like a very, it seemed to me, unvarnished view of what it's like to um, start to become quite famous with a lot of people really recognizing you um, to be on TV, you know, to have your name kind of emblazoned on this television show and um, to become a household name. And um, I'm curious. Parts of, parts of it were wonderful. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, uh, people will, will say uh, you get a lot of perks. You know, and you, you get a lot of things for free that you couldn't afford when you weren't famous. And um, one of the things I loved the most was I'd call up a, a, a number to pay a bill and the person on the other line would recognize my voice or my name. And they would say, hey, Mel, I, I, I was so moved the other night by something you did, or I laughed so hard at something you did the other night. And that was like a one-on-one -on -one immediate kind of audience theater thing. That, that made me feel wonderful. And uh, the thing that was disturbing was the endowment of power that people gave me who didn't get the talent. They just got the sense that there was this phenomenon. It was a person on their television screen. They owned that person. Um, they had an intimate relationship and they had certain entitlements uh, to get from that person that could be very disturbing and disturbed a lot of people. I had a lot of nutty fans that showed up at the studio and insinuated themselves onto the lot and had to be shaken off and taken away by security. Um, you know, several of us have experienced that at ABC Studios. Back in the day, the soap operas, General Hospital, Lawrence Welk, and Fridays were all shooting from the same studio. <laughs> so we had different strata of looky-loos and fame seekers who would come to the gate very polarizingly different groups. The soap opera group was so different from the nighttime comedy group. and so different from Lawrence Welk's group. I actually had to share a dressing room with Lawrence Welk the first year I was on the show because we shared his stage and he and I had the star dressing rooms. And I would come up and there'd be an accordion, you know, lying on the floor. <laughs> and our, the, the clashes of consciousness between Lawrence Welk's show, which was a very straight and wholesome show and our edgy, politically liberal, show following in the next few days. It was like a completely different plasma was in the air uh, when they left and we came in on Thursdays. Well, I'm very curious to ask, um, you know, you've given such, I would say, um, like I said, you know, an unvarnished and, and even cautionary view of fame. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, what other, you know, people who experienced fame kind of shared with you about how they felt about it? Did they have similar feelings about it? Um, because one other, um, one scene really um, stuck out to me, which is when you go in to read um, for uh, the King of Comedy, uh, Scorsese okay. and De Niro. And you have this kind of simmering hatred towards De Niro, I think, because he's just really famous. And it's, he's very, and it's like, well, where does, where does he get off? You know, what, what's that, you know? And it's, it's like this desire to prove oneself that's very relatable. And it turns out, oh, he's very friend, he's very friendly, you know, but you would almost prefer that he wasn't so that you could despise him. Um, not you, but one would. Um, 
They were the sweetest. Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro were the sweetest. And a friend of mine, Lorraine Newman, also auditioned for that part. Neither of us got it. Uh, Sandra Bernhardt was wonderful in the part, uh, playing a crazy comedian. Um, I was so intimidated by everybody I, I was meeting who was a big name at that time. It would make me feel like a nothing, you know, just like a little piece of lint. So one of the ways I goaded myself into having confidence was I'd sit in the lobby as well. I was preparing the, the uh, story that I was going to be in. I was also angry at the fame, the, the pay, person who was about to see me and all the power they had. And I would say, oh, screw you, or, you know, the hell with you. Who do you think you are? You're nothing good. And so when De Niro came in, I was in the middle of one of those inner monologues. And so I was able to just smile and kind of laugh to myself because he had no idea what I'd been saying about him behind his back. And that kind of irony uh, gave me the confidence to do a really good job at the audition. And in the audition, I had to shove him against the wall and push him around and overpower him. So it was very good that I had countered my in intimidation with that kind of anger. That's what I needed in order to be in the room at first with, with those big names who I admired so much. And that's a skill I teach. I, I coach a lot of young actors uh, online uh, these days. And I tell them if they are really that intimidated to get in touch with their anger and it's kind of like a, an intervention in their intimidation and fear. They get in touch with their legitimized anger. It helps them get through. That's great advice. Um, I'm curious, I know you've written some creative projects before. How did writing this book differ? Was it harder to write about yourself or did that make it easier? Well, uh, there's certainly a wealth of material. Um, I thank my parents and my small town grown, growing up uh, with some of that material. Um, you know, I've written a lot of screenplays and they're always fictitious. And uh, I found those easier, actually. I didn't have to drudge up and confront myself. It was like an acting role where I would be embodying the part of a uh, Chicago trading floor smart ass guy. Um, I love embodying African-American people in my writing, although I think that's not allowed anymore. Um, but I think you can write fictitious pieces and uh, still get away with it. Um, I had such influence by black people in my, my best friend in, in, in at West Haven High was a black girl, Susan Holmes. She became the valedictorian actually. And um, I did not see color because my father uh, was very friendly with everybody. We, had, uh, we were, uh, my father owned a Jewish tailor in a, next to a Chinese restaurant in uh, New Haven at Chung King restaurant. We had a, a tailor shop, a cl dry cleaner and tailor shop right next door to Chung King restaurant. So the waiters were my babysitters. They would take care of me often uh, between lunch and dinner when my parents couldn't afford a sitter after school. So um, I've been thrown amongst people of color all my life. It's never been a big deal to me. And I love writing African-American characters. I have a screenplay called Rachel Face the Music, which is about a white woman on the tr Chicago trading floor who turns a little black girl's intellectual property into a stock, a penny stock and uh, corrupts the girl. And at the last minute when the girl is about to have a recording contract with Sony, she pulls the plug on the girl's act because she sees what a monster she's becoming. She's becoming just like the woman. And I've been trying to sell this screenplay for years. It's set in the past now because the Chicago trading floor is not what it used to be. Um, it's all computerized. So um, I loved writing that role on the little girl's guardians, these two African-American women, these two sisters. I loved writing them. Those, I felt almost, I channeled them. That was so easy for me. It was harder to put my family in, at risk and under the, the microscope. Um, my mother who still lives in Hamden, she's 97, uh, has read parts of the book. I didn't send her every chapter because I knew they would, some of the chapters might trouble her. Uh, and, um, she really enjoying the parts that don't have to do with our family. Um, so yeah, it is risky writing a memoir. I think every memoirist has some people angry with them. And that was the risk. Towards the end of the book, you write about your fondness for writing and how you used to do it to fill the time between acting jobs and now it's sort of flipped into acting between writing. Um, what is it about writing that you you love so much um, and just suddenly now as opposed to your younger years and do you think that might relate to your life experience maybe you weren't ready for it yet 
when you were younger? Well, I love acting with others. I mean, there's no doubt about it. In the last year and a half, I think a lot of actors have suffered greatly at not being able to act with others, except in a Zoom situation, which kind of took the edge off, but isn't the whole thing. Um, but I find that as I'm maturing, um, words are doing the heavy lifting that my performing body used to do. I'm finding that I can make people laugh and be moved to, to tears or realization with my words. And it's certainly a, a lower stress way to create for people. Uh, I really like having these audiences of one where people will call me and say, I was so touched by this section of the book or this really told me about myself, this, this section here. And that has given me greater gratification than millions of strangers who aren't in touch with me enjoying my work. It's been um, very gratifying. So there's a new kind of delayed gratification that I'm getting from being a writer. There's no applause in the room, God knows, but um, there are people touched by it. So these one-on-one -on -one exchanges with readers are becoming very valuable to me um, in a different way than my one on a million uh, contacts were. Well, your, um, your time, you know, a little later in your career on Rugrats um, will appeal to, you know, a lot of our, a lot of our younger uh, viewers and um, pretty much anyone in my generation um, since the show was ubiquitous um, from my birth, essentially. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that experience was like since these, this show was, was so popular and is so popular? You know, we just did a pilot. We had no idea uh, what would happen in the future. And I had never done a cartoon before. And so it was just me and Jack Riley, the late, great Jack Riley, who played Stu Pickles, and uh, Michael Bell in a room recording these stories. And a year later, I'd almost forgotten about it. I was invited to attend the pilot premiere of the Rugrats show. And I was enthralled because here was my mother's voice, because I was using my mother's voice on the show, not my own voice, coming out of this creature, you know, with this red, red hair and this little pink dress and these glasses. And it was just, wow, it was a wonderful thing. So I was very excited when they picked us up for another seven episodes. And we went into the studio and did some more. And it was just a lark. I was also doing another show simultaneously. So I used to have to be driven from one set to the other. I was doing a show called Parker Lewis. And so I would go from playing the sweetest mommy in the world as an erotic Dee Dee Pickles character to playing this harridan of a narcissistic pre uh, principal of a fictitious high school on the other set. And you know, to, to me, it was the most happy I've ever been because I was able to play different aspects of myself. I wasn't stuck in this one monotonous groove. I was you know, playing different aspects. And um, who knew that Rugrats would be the long lasting success that it was? I mean, my voice has been associated it, with it since 1990, I 1990. guess, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just a very long time to be associated. And of course, after the show became a hit and rerun, they brought us all back and we recorded in a number of seasons more and films and action figures and commercials and um, you know video games. And it was just a phenomenon. I have all kinds of merchandise from it that I won't show you now. There was even Rugrats macaroni and cheese. I mean, in the stores, it was- I used to I, love that. I loved it. I mean, it wasn't, um, it wasn't like my body or my face was being associated with this character. In fact, I, I did a charity event for a synagogue in Los Angeles and I came in and spoke as Dee Dee Pickle and there was a little four-year-old boy there and he was so amazed looking at me. He said, well, how do you color yourself in? He just didn't understand the phenomenon of me not being the whole physical character when I appeared because I look very different in the cartoon. So there were a lot of real thrills that have come out of doing Roadgrass and also that I wasn't followed home from the studios or I wasn't harassed. I used to have to stop at 7-Eleven after Friday's shows when we taped late on Friday nights and ask the local hookers if there was anybody following me and they would check out the parking lot and say, Oh, no, honey, you're fine. Nobody on your ass tonight. You know, oh, I like your tights. So <laughs> I have these relationships with these guardians along the way that were really wonderful for me and made me feel safe. But I didn't need that anymore. I also didn't need to wear makeup or get my hair done or wear high heels. It was really a, a wonderful, cushy, lucky, lucky job. Uh, it looks like we have um, some questions. 
from um, from viewers. So this one, I was a big fan of yours on Fridays, never missed an episode. Is it true or is it a rumor that the Reagan administration was upset with your brilliant portrayal of Nancy and that they protested to ABC? Um, I don't think that was serious. I mean, they'd already seen Saturday Night Live for the five previous years. They knew that this was satire. I'm sure I, wouldn't, I wasn't invited to the White House, but the interesting thing was that Patty Davis was invited. She was like an insurrectionist against her father uh, and her mother while the Reagan administration was full on. She guested on our show and uh, to shake a fist at her father, I guess. And um, she and I hung out, we became buddies. And every time we went to a screening or a movie, there were a tales of people following us. Like there was security in the, in the traffic. And then she and I would get out of a, the audience and go to the restroom. And there would be two women that would come into the restroom with us plainclothes women. And they would wash their hands for a while. And they would follow us back discreetly into the audience. I mean, that was an interesting phenomenon. That was fame, you know, that was really at risk fame. I think she had a lot of negative press, uh, certainly from the conservative movement about her words against her dad. I'm sure that Nancy Reagan was, you know, indignant, but fine. I'm sure she didn't have any vendettas. I used to think maybe she should impersonate me and retaliate, <laughs> but she never did. I also wanted to ask you about a very notable or what seemed to me a very notable uh, incident or event on, uh, on Fridays when, um, you're, you're in a scene um, seated next to Andy Kaufman and uh, Kaufman comes in and he suddenly appears to break character, it seems. And um, can you tell us a little bit about that since it was, since it's, you know, been written about? It's been written about and it's been in a movie. I mean, this is how infamous this moment was. Well, we've worked with Andy before and I worked with Andy before and he, were kind of, he and I were kind of buddies. He was a really nice Jewish guy. I know that it's, it's hard to believe. He was a really nice person in real life if he ever had a real life. And um, we knew at the beginning of the show that he was gonna be breaking out. Uh, we also understood that since that sketch never really had an ending, we were in for some chaos. And we were told to just stay in character and like go for it. Now the crew didn't know this and the other cast members did not know this either. Uh, we were just told to play along. So I'm doing this scene where a, a very conservative group of people each go to the restroom one by one and get stoned and come out changed. And so uh, Mary Edith went to the restroom, Michael Richards went to the restroom and came out kind of altered. And then Andy went to the restroom and came out and he looked very troubled and bewildered. He didn't say his next line. He says, ah, I don't want to act stoned. I can't play stoned. And I went, what are you saying? I, I stayed in the, the you know, the, the prissy little wife character, what do you mean you can't play stoned? And so Michael threw the, the cue cards at Andy and the crew got like really scared. I mean, this is traumatic for the audience in the room and for the crew, because they didn't know what was gonna happen. And then Mike and, 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 and Andy got into a fake fight and our producer came up on stage and grabbed Andy and then they went, they went to commercial. And so this was kind of reality TV, you know, very rudimentary reality TV. And this really put Fridays on the map of all the great artistry and the talent that we had. This was the thing that people continued to talk about this debacle of an incident, you know, and I was a Broadway professional. I was used to, to getting laughs and controversy from good work, but I had to admit that this breakout has stuck with me. Almost everyone asks me that, Isaac. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, you're typical. <laughs> I'm, I'm well aware, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, on to, it's on YouTube if anybody is interested in watching the mess that it was. I also, I was interested, I, we watched like a, a bunch of Fridays before um, this event. And I think you mentioned in the book, you're friendly with Jane Curtin. And I was watching like, cause I was familiar with her from SNL and her newscasting for Weekend Update, but um, it was cool to see you doing that too. Um, did you guys like chat about that since you're friends? <laughs> Never got to, we weren't friends. We were actually in an off-Broadway show together called The Proposition, which was an improvised musical review that came down from Boston. And I was one of the first New York replacements. And um, she's a genius improviser and she could do so many great characters, which like me, she never got to do on Saturday Night Live because the guys were the most aggressive and 
and Gilda was so good and so aggressive. Um, it was just very funny because I had auditioned for Laugh-In and I, in my head, I thought I'm meant to be in this show. I'm, I can do all those things and I'm funny and I'm an improviser. And when I didn't get it, I was sort of shattered. And then they created a new show just like that, an imitation clone of that show. And I got to be on that one. So I thought how ironic, Jane will see me sitting here told to do what she did on her show. And she'll think I'm stealing from her. Uh -huh. And uh, I think she had no, no, no gripe about it at all. She probably thought also that it was very ironic that I was in the same seat as she, dealing with the objectification that the writers always put on us. You know, she had to say she was only wearing underwear on the air sometimes, and they would do other things to objectify me. Yeah, it was funny, you know, uh, female objectification, which we embraced back then because it was very little, you know, we could do about it. Um, it was a big part of comedy and um, we played it. I noticed that when I was watching, I was like, um because our supervisor, Seth, was a big fan of that show. And I was like, you know, like, she's good, but a lot of that's not funny. It's kind of offensive. And he's like, oh, it's generational, you know. So um, that was interesting to me. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I, I'm sure we're all seeing stuff from like the 50s and 60s now that pisses the hell out of us. I mean, it's just so insulting. I mean, there's so many things just shot three years ago that are assaultive on our new sensitivities. We are seeing race so much differently now. We're seeing female sexuality so much differently now. It's really a blowout time that we're living in right now. You know, so keep your, keep your eyes open and your ears open. We're going through some changes. This culture is changing. We do have a couple more questions from the audience before we um, say goodbye for the day. Uh, Scott says, hi, Melanie. I was a huge fan of Parker Lewis, where you portrayed Principal Grace Musso. Uh, very, a very underrated sitcom and very well acted and written. I think your character absolutely stole the show. Do you still do Principal Musso's classic thumb swoosh move to this day? And can you break glass doors with a simple, simple flip of your thumb in real life? And do you share your character's love of men with beards in large hands. <laughs> My husband has a beard in large hands. That is so funny. He grew it during the, 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 the uh, pandemic era. Um, I do like beards um, and strong hands because I have really flimsy weak hands. So I'm, I'm a fan of strong hands. Um, you know, that was a show where special effects really enhanced my character. And when I first read the script to audition for it, I thought, this show has special effects in almost every scene. We're gonna be shooting all night. And it really was like shooting a horror movie or a sci-fi movie. I mean, my, my thumb would smoke sometimes, smoke would come out, fire would come out of my ears, uh, sparks would come off my high-heeled shoes, um, and glass would break every time I, I opened a door or slammed a door. Um, no, I can't do that in real life, thank God. There'd be a lot of expense around my house <laughs> if I could. But boy, it was fun to have that kind of power in, you know, put upon, put upon that character. I love that character. And I love the kids on that show. They're all grown and gray haired men now. Um, yeah, really, that was a great time. You know, it didn't run long enough for me to really get all the satisfaction I was hoping for out of it. But yeah, they're, they're, they're YouTubes from it and they're still holding up. Well, before we go, I just want to uh, remind people that we do have a copy of Melanie's book here. Uh, it's behind me as well as uh, the Best of Fridays. Um, and there's more than just the Fridays that are here, but we do have this at the library and you can borrow it. Um, and um, I think, um, Rory, do you want to take us out? Yeah. So, um, hang on one second. Um, so this has been Book Sandwiched In, uh, and this was brought to you uh, in, uh, made possible by gifts to the New Haven Free Public Library Foundation. And if you're interested, if you enjoyed participating, uh, please consider making a donation at nhfpl.org backslash donate um, to help support our collections, our programs and services throughout the year. Um, please join us again at the same time in two weeks on Thursday, June 24th, Isaac and another of our colleagues will be chatting with Dr. Brian Mitchell about
his new graphic memoir, Monumental, Oscar Dunn and His Radical Fight in Reconstruction, Louisiana. Information about this and all of our events is available on our website at nhfpl.org. And thank you so much, Melanie, for coming and, and spending some time with us today. It was so great to see you again in this time without masks. Um, and we, we really enjoyed you and your book.